welcome back to Better Tomorrow. So glad that you're here. And we have a, probably one of the most, uh, I feel like I was so inspired learning more about. Kelty Knight is here. She's You've had like so many different jobs and crushed all of them. And so I'm so happy to be able to learn more from you. And I think the listeners will too. I love it so much. Thanks for having me, Hannah. And also <clears throat> when we were texting or DMing online, um, the last time I think I saw, I mean, I've seen you since, but the last time I interviewed you was when you were doing Dancing with the Stars and we went to open Star Wars land at Disneyland and my foot was broken. And I was like, yes. I have this great picture of you. And I was like, you were just like, you know, you had just come off the show and then had done Dancing with the Stars and you were just like spinning. And I was like, I remember grabbing your shoulder. You were like, how do you get good clothes? And I was like, oh, you have so much to learn. <laughs> like, I'm so excited for you. And here you are. I had like four shirts I think at that point and I really needed to get a therapy so bad but I was just trying to learn how to cha-cha you it was, know it you know it worked out but we definitely needed some time after to get yeah. life together and we're that's here it. that's everyone you're here and you're doing amazing sweetie in the words thank, of Chris Jenner thank you I kind of want to just start like way back because yeah, okay I didn't know that you were a, a dancer. Yes. Um, when did you start? And that's like how you got your start. When yeah. Wait, you start? weren't you a dancer as well? I was, but not like, I was not going to be a professional dancer. That's for sure. Okay. Like you, n that was not ever. Okay. My mom put me in dance, but I was not yeah. passionate about it. And I think you have to have like an extreme level yes. of passion to really be able to take uh, the rejection and the nose and the everything that goes into like making that a career. Yeah. Um, that was not me. Yeah. And then I well, did it on TV and <laughs> it's still, I still, I still, that was hard and I still don't think I can dance, but you did uh, great. You did gr great. Well, when I was a kid, I grew up in the, like a small, a hamlet, if you will, in Canada and, um, very typical, mean? like it's like smaller than a town. Okay. Oh, it's like okay. a hamlet. I don't know. Anyway, it's a hamlet. It's called Sherwood Park. And um, I grew up in this it, uh, in Canada. And in Canada, it's cold like most of the time. And so when you're growing up, there's like really like two things to do. You either like play hockey or you dance. Like you need an indoor sport because nine months of the year, you it's like you die if you go outside. So a lot of the boys and some of the girls played hockey and then people danced. And so I was never good. I started when I was like five. I did the typical like, you know, same as you get put in dance. But I just loved it. And I loved performing. Um, and I actually went to performing arts high school, like in Edmonton, which is the big, big city, which is like far away. And I got my first dance job when I was like halfway through my senior year of high school. So like I had, I was like, I'm, I'm such an overachiever, obviously. And, um, I had graduate, I had enough credits to graduate high school. And so like in March of my senior year, I was like, bye, I'm going to go dance on a cruise ship in the Caribbean. Like I'll come back for the prom. <laughs> and so like popped back in for prom and then left again. Like it was just really wild. Um, but for me, like I, I really always believed and just thought in my brain ever since I saw Kat when I was in second grade that I was meant to go to New York City and be on Broadway and had these big dreams and like I just wasn't meant to be in a Hamlet. I'm not a Hamlet kind of girl. And so dance was my way out and I wasn't the best, but I it really was that way out and I had watched other people from my community kind of like go and work in Japan and work in Paris and different things like that. So that was my escape. And then I moved to New York when I was 19 um, with no money, no anything and, um, started auditioning and I never got a Broadway show, but I did audition for like over 35 of them and unsuccessfully. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, I'm on and was a rocket, a backup dance for Taylor and Beyonce and did music videos and movies and kinds of really fun stuff. It was a great career. And, and I got elder and decided to change jobs. Um, I first just want to go back to cats. <laughs> <You're> like, <"What?" laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Magical Mr. Mustafa's. Oh. I had this weird Aunt Vera who was like a real artsy, fartsy lady in Edmonton, mm -hmm. which is like the town where I kind of where I near I grew up. And you know, they had like the touring companies of shows, and she took me to Cats, and I was like, I saw Magical Mr. Mustafa's in his sequined rhinestone unitard and i was like i'll never be the same oh and then rumple teaser you know he's the sexy cat rumple yes. anyway um and he was doing like hip thrusts and like in a dance belt which is like when the boys like pull up their into like in it's like a little package in the front like a ballerina and i was like these are my people i'm meant to be i'm meant to be a, a show girl and so cats really changed my life and um i didn't see the movie with taylor in it because i just knew it was i heard it was so bad and i didn't like the fur so i'm just like staying stage cats stage cats changed my life but i'm a dog um, person but anyway it was great so i also had this weird thing with cats when i was little i've never heard anybody else say this i i didn't ever get to go to the musical uh but I had the musical on like VHS and I watched it so many times. Like I wore it out. Like that was my favorite. That and Grease were the two movies that I watched when I was little and I was obsessed with cats. And I think that was also like when I really saw people like perform on stage and be like, oh my gosh, that looks so fun. I relate to not always feeling like the best, but I think I really mm -hmm. got in my head about, oh, like, I'm an overachiever. So I saw the best in the class. I'm like, oh, well, I just kind of gave up on that dream. With you, you're like, I, you said that you weren't like maybe the best at your studio, but you were, you still like went for it and you made it happen. How did you have that confidence to do that? Yeah, I think that there's a misnomer in on earth that like the best people win. And, mm -hmm. and, and, like, yes, we see that happen, of course. But when you're watching the, you know, when you watch the Olympics or you watch anyone that's like a super, even like Tom Brady is very famous for being like, I was actually kind of bad and then I got good. Like, I actually think not being the best is your superpower. Um, for me, like growing up, I was kind of a back row dancer. I never really won like the gold medal. I was never like Miss Dance or whatever at the competitions. And, but I still really loved it. And it gave me the tenacity and the drive and the ability to overcome people not thinking I was great and the rejection of it all. And so that has served me so well. And I had so many friends from sort of my dance community come out to New York um, at the same time as me to try to sort of make it. It was like a big dream for a lot of us. And a lot of them lasted like six months, a year. And it was because they were so used to winning and they were so used to getting picked that when they went to an audition and they didn't get picked, it ruined them. They could not get out of bed the next morning. And for me, rejection has been like, oh, well, you're wrong. You're wrong about me. And I'm just going to now show you how wrong you are. And this like goes to everything, ex-boyfriends, ex-jobs, people that didn't pick me. Like I'm very petty. I'm very much like, I think that's where a lot of my drive comes. I've also done a lot of therapy on this and I'm trying to be like chiller about it. But I really just believe that being an underdog is, it can, it can really be a superpower. And I feel like that's why I always have loved your story too, is because you're kind of like a little bit of this underdog story and, and it just, it really is inspiring. And, you know, getting good with rejection is the secret to Hollywood. You see so many people. I've interviewed celebrities for over a decade. I have interviewed more one moment celebrities than I care to say. Like I saw you, you were the biggest thing. We did this big interview with you and then poof, you're gone. And I really do believe it's if you don't have the work ethic and you don't have the tenacity and you don't have the resilience, you will not last in this business. It's impossible. I definitely agree. I think as a young child, I didn't have, I was lived in a small town and I feel like I was like expected to be the best at everything. And dance was like my first, I have to still go to therapy because I have these like reoccurring dreams about dance and not feeling good enough. And that was like my first rejection was not making the dance company the first year I tried out. And then mm -hmm. I went back and I'm like, I'm, and I did it. And then I made it the next year and I went back and did the whole thing. But that was my first like rejection. And then I never wanted that to happen again. 
until then it happened on national television. And then I think that, like you said, was a superpower for me because I had to be vulnerable about it. It was being captured. And that is where I feel like people have related so much to my story. And I have to just keep showing up that way because I have been rejected. It, it's like you said, Hollywood is not um, easy for anyone, but I think that's what makes people like the best because they can handle rejection. They work super freaking hard. And then their product is the result of those both equaling out and balancing. Yeah. But it's so interesting to hear because as I was like looking at all that you've done, I'm like, oh, she's just used to being like the best. I did not. It's I that's how I genuinely thought like, oh, she's like type A, does everything perfect and gets it all right. And that's why you have like this long list of accomplishments. I think that's what a lot of people think about very successful people. Yeah. But hearing that backstory um, can make people right now that feel like they're like in the loser spot. It's yeah. Like, no. You will come back and come back with vengeance. And, yeah. yeah. You come back with vengeance. And, and and it's interesting because like at this time in my life, you know, Superfan was born out of necessity. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on a new show. I have a new show coming out. Superfan had been a little bit in development. But once I kind of lost that job, I put the pedal to the metal because I, I had this feeling like, oh, well, when I, when everyone hears that I'm not working at this place anymore, like the phone's going to ring. Cause like, I'm doing this. I got the Emmys. I got the Rolodex. Like I can get you in the room with whoever, like I, you know, I'm like, I'm the girl and no one called like no jobs, like not, not an audition, not a, we want you to host cupcake wars or whatever the hell it was like, not there was nothing. It was dead silence. I was like, has everyone, oh, I actually, and I had this imposter syndrome where I was like, mm -hmm. I've been working. I really thought I was working and I had a career and I was like maybe meaningful in this one career. And I felt like nothing. I felt like absolute garbage. And so that's when I put the pedal to the metal on Superfan. And I was like, well, you have two choices. You can quit and move to an island and just be like, okay, I did my 10 years and like I'm off and you're never going to see me again. Or you can go and do the thing that you've always really wanted to do, which is I've always wanted to host a music show. Um, and I've had this idea since 2014. And so I was like, you know what, this is a sign. And it was so hard because my ego was just broken. I was just a shell of a human, lost my way of life, lost the thing I had done, gotten up to do every year, day for 10 years. Um, and to stand on my own two feet when no one believed in me and be like, I believe in the show. I can sell the show. I can make the show. I'm going to make this reality. And then I'm going to host it. I'm going to create it. And then I'm going to host it. And everyone's going to be like, who's the host? Me. I hired myself because none of you motherfuckers would hire me. <laughs> and, um, and so that's really what's happening right now, which is why I'm like an emotional basket case and why this underdog conversation is so meaningful. It's because, you know, I do think when people look at people like you, like me, they're like, like, oh, it's so easy because God, she's so beautiful. She's so beloved. I mean, we have great hair. Like that's honestly, that's, yeah. that's easy. <laughs> that, I mean, I do a lot of face masks, but like, you know, listen, I, we're pretty girls. And, and so mm -hmm. some, there's the power and the pretty and all of that, but like, you know, it, they look at people like us and they're like, oh, it's just been handed to them. And I, I just want to dispel that because nothing has been handed to me. I have fought so freaking hard and I have wanted to sit at a table that would not give me a seat and still will mm -hmm. not give me a seat for so long. And, um, and it's just, it's, it can be really soul crushing. And I feel like, you know, even for people that are not in Hollywood, if you are in a relationship that is not serving you in that way, if you have a job and you're like, I wish I should be getting the promotion, I should be getting the raise. I feel like, you know, all of those in your own family dynamics, like everyone has felt that feeling of just being flattened by life and it's just it is a really relatable thing sorry that was a tangent but yes I mean I think that is why I connect when I was looking at your story of like you've reinvented yourself also so many times like you haven't it's like you accomplish a dream and then you you go to the next one and then to know now it was out of necessity that's even like more awesome to me because it shows that like you get when like rejection comes to you, you know how to handle it and move forward. And with that, do you 
suffer or like really deal with like a bitterness when that happens. Like for me, I think we had the same, like uh, coming from a small town, like there was, I always sometimes feel like, I think I'm supposed to be at this table, but I don't think y'all think I'm supposed to be at this table because I didn't come from the same place, same place you did. Do you suffer with like a bitterness or like, um, I'm going to prove you wrong in like everything that you, you do because of that? Yeah. I mean, for me, I, 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 I constantly am reminding myself and I've said this before, but I, that there's like two kinds of girls. There's like hustle girls and cool girls. And for me in my dream world, I'm that girl that's like getting invited to fashion shows and getting yeah. to go to the icons party and walk the red carpet and, and, and like a cool girl, you know, like a, like just a cool Hollywood girl. That's like, Oh, yeah. they're doing the, you know, Chanel show on the pier. Like you should go. And, and like, but then the truth is like, I, I'm not in that group and mm -hmm. I don't get invited to those things. And there's times, especially like right now, cause we're in like promo for the show. And I was like, mm -hmm. wait, well, like, like take a look at all the things and I'm a female creator and I made this show myself and like, can you support me? You know? And when that stuff doesn't work out, it's, it's, it's really hard. But, but at the end of the day, I, I think it's longer lasting mm -hmm. to be a hustle girl because to be a cool girl seems it, it's very of the moment. You know, it's like, oh, you're you're the face of you're the girl from TikTok. You're the girl from YouTube or whatever like that all, you know, it comes and goes quite quickly um, for most. And so I'm happy that I have the kind of career that I have where it's up to me how hard I want to work and then I can make things happen and, and continue to work. But it it is exhausting to be your only champion in a way, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to say my only champion. I've had absolute huge champions in my life. My, my producing partner for super fan, Jody Roth is a massive champion for me. She used to be an executive at CBS. She gave me so many opportunities. And then when she left CBS, we partnered up. And so like, you know, I've had huge champions and that's been amazing, but it's kind of exhausting to be your own cheerleader all the time. And you mm -hmm. just want, you just, you get in this mind frame where it'd be easier if like everyone could just get on board mm -hmm. um, the the Kelty show, but that just hasn't happened for me in a big way yet. Um, but I will say that I think um, what I do have is the resume. What I do have is the work I have worked now consistently for, you know, 20, 20 plus years in Hollywood in some way, which was my dream. Um, I saved my money. I have a nice retirement account. I have a house. I have um, a husband that I love. I have best friends that don't even exist on the internet that like keep me grounded. And and so, you know, I have to do a lot of soul searching when I don't get invited to the cool party to be like, no, 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 your life is still really good. And when I got to the cool party, I would literally just want to go home and get in bed with my dog and read anyway. So. I feel this so much because I'm not a cool girl either. <laughs> and I want to be so bad. Most of my, like, we talked about this last night. Um, because, yeah, it's, I want to be cool. I'm just not. But I do believe in myself and I know that I'm supposed to do big things. Um, but it can be really hard. I also have people that, like, support me and, and keep pushing me forward. But, like you're doing it. You're leading the way for the hustlers. For the hustle girls. Like yes. I just, I just, you know, and, and there is something nice about it. Like I, I keep having this manifestation that, you know, I'm, we're doing a big uh, event for super fan in Times Square. And it's been a passion. It's been a real dream of mine to have like an event for this mm -hmm. show. And I got a real good sparkly dress and like, I'm really excited about it. And I keep just picturing myself on that stage and I'm like, uh, you know, and there's going to be a big billboard that's going to play the show and stuff. And and I keep thinking like, Kelty, is this going to be enough for you? Like, mm -hmm. I also hate being a hustle girl because it's like, it's never enough. It's yeah. like, there's always something else to want. And I'm like, please, like just even in therapy yesterday, I was like, please like calm down for a minute and just take it in and enjoy this moment because you worked so hard on it and here it is and it's happening. You're having your moment. This is what you wanted. You're having your thing. Like, I hope that I'm not standing there watching it being like, well, it would be better if like, I just, mm. I hope my 
keltiness can like unkelty itself for five minutes so I can freaking enjoy myself. I also struggle with that. Do you have a hard time celebrating yourself? Like I'm always like, what's next? Great. This happened. What's next? Um, do you find that as a struggle? Or are you always like, oh, great. This is here. But you're just trying to, you're picking out the things that could have been better. It's it just like, I just, I don't know. I think there's a weird thing. Like, I think there's a weird thing with women. Like, are we allowed to celebrate ourselves? Mm -hmm. Like, I think we're taught that we're not allowed. And, and it's been interesting, like, and living, you know, in, not on, on the internet, but like having, you know, podcasts that lives on the, you know, an internet community, if you will. Yeah. It's like, I feel like sometimes people are only rooting for you when you're failing. And when something really good does happen, I think it is really triggering for other people. And I think that, I think that's what makes social media really weirdly addictive. And, and so many things it's like, you know, I could see you, like I could be on your Instagram and you'll be, um, you know, I think there was a few weeks ago, you spoke at like a panel, you were wearing a very beautiful pink dress. Oh, yeah. So I remember seeing you, it was like a big fancy panel where like really important people were talking and you were at the panel. So like that put photo, and I'm not saying I felt this way, but I'm like going to use this as yes. an example. Like someone out there sees that and they're like, wow, she looks amazing. I love her dress. And then they're like, well, why? why her? Why not me? Mm -hmm. And then you get a little jealous and then you're feeling like, well, I wish it was me. And then you feel bad about yourself. And so like, it's a weird thing where we're happy for people, but then we want it for ourselves. And like, are we ever happy? So I feel like I get more support when things are going really terribly in my life and I'm like bombing. Um, and then when something really good is happening, it's like crickets. And I'm not from my best people, obviously not from my mm -hmm. like best circle, but like, that's just a weird cultural thing. Do you ever feel that way? Like, it's like when you're like having your meltdowns, people are like, you've got this, you know, and, and maybe that's just like, I call myself a really good crisis friend because I'm so busy that I'm not like the best, like just call you to chit chat. But like when your mom's in the hospital or you get a divorce or you are sick, like I'm there. I'm the person with the food, with the booze. Like I am the best crisis friend of all time. And maybe we just like are an internet of crisis people that like when people are failing, we feel like we need to pick them. I don't know. I, yeah, no, I also like, I know for myself, I relate to, I'm there when you really need me, but I will not text you back about a show that you watched last yeah, night. Like, right. I, like I'm doing too many different things. I have 4,000 things going on in my head just right now. I can't think about this new yeah. show. So yeah, I think that is like, that could make sense that maybe we're just like programmed to in crisis act. So if you follow or you're a fan of somebody, you want to be like, don't go anywhere. We've got you. So yeah, I definitely yeah. think I've felt that in times where I was struggling. Um, I think when you are doing well, that's when there's just so much more criticism that comes. Yeah. But you also, like you said, you kind of do that to yourself too. But it's like, yeah. oh yeah, like I'm doing this thing. It's so great. I launched a podcast. I launched a freaking show Yeah, that's on like national television, but this wasn't right. I wonder if people are going to notice this and yeah. it could have been better. Well, it's funny you say that because for Superfan, the LL Cool J episode is our first episode mm -hmm. and it was my worst show. We did six episodes. It's the it's the one where I, because and you'll love the I know you're a fashion girl too. Yeah. So like I really wanted the outfits to be insane, and you guys know how like a good dress or a bad dress will really mess Make up your whole feel. vibe. Yes. yes, and so I loved every single one of my outfits, and I loved I'm wearing like this blue. We we shot a little bit ago, so it's a little dated, mm -hmm. but um, I'm wearing this blue like little mini mini dress. It's Mugler, and I and a Louboutin here, like and millions of dollars with the like I love it, love it, love it. And I really wanted to do that like around the way girl thing because it was mm -hmm. like LL Cool J, and I was like, oh, I'll do the fly girl. I really didn't wear like little mini dresses at any point on the, sh I mean, I wore short dresses cause that's my love language, but like some of them had sleeves. This was the most naked I was. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, and we did the show and I just felt so uncomfortable the whole day. I was just too naked. It was like a corset. I was like, I was too naked. I did not feel good. And that was the day that they had me do like my producer EPK. So I'm standing on the stage by myself in front of this audience. And they're like, throwing me questions about like, what's it like to create the show? And I'm like, here I am looking like a hoe in my hoe <laughs> dress, talking about being an executive producer. Like it just all felt wrong. I didn't like, I mean, I didn't like 
my hair was like, I was trying to do Carrie Bradshaw yeah. and it was like, it was fine, but it's like, I'm not Carrie Bradshaw. Bradshaw, like just a whole, it didn't come together the perfect package. And like, of course, that's our premiere episode. So of course, that's the episode we're doing the big event for and everyone's going to be in Times Square watching. And I'm like, it's my least, I love the show. Like, I think the show is amazing as a whole. But like for my Kelty performance, it's my least favorite Kelty. And I'm like, I'm so hard on myself. Like Kelty, chill out. No one's going to notice. No, like, okay, at no all. one's going to notice that. And but I get be like, it. wow, you look, you look bomb, but I'm going to be like, oh God, I still like, I'm kind of cringy about it. Like, I just feel like it's too much. I feel that. I don't so have, I have boobs, get, but it's like too naked. I want to talk all about super fan, but I first want to ask because how I know you is yes. you um, have interviewed literally everyone, but now knowing your backstory, you were a dancer. Yeah. How are you exposed to even this type of job? Was it something that you always wanted to do? Mm -hmm. Um, how did you get into that? I love this. And I love that I'm telling this story that I'm about to tell on your podcast. So <laughs> it just really is really fitting. So I was a professional dancer and I'd, I'd moved out from New York to LA. Um, and I, I just was, I got really over the New York dance scene and I, I was like, there's gotta be more. Cause I was feeling unfulfilled. So I came mm -hmm. out to LA and was auditioning and I ended up working, um, uh, I was, I was working and, and dancing and stuff. And, and when you are a dancer, you make no money. So I could, you know, mm -hmm. barely afford my rent. And I saw a job posted that was like, Hey, we're looking for a music host for this the show. And I had at that time, like Facebook, I had, I had done some blogging. I had done some vlogging on the internet, like, you know, just like whatever around my dance career. And mm -hmm. I had a little blog and anyway, so I was like, Oh, I'm just going to go in for this job. And I booked the job. I had no experience hosting anything. Um, and I was like, wait, and then I got the contract and I was like, wait, you're going to, and I, it wasn't even great money, but it was something like, you're going to pay me like $1,700 for two weeks. And like, all I have to do is put on jeans and talk. There's no splits. Like, <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. And so I was like, yes, yes, yes. So I did that job and then I was still dancing and I went back and I actually booked the Beyonce gig. And so I was working with Beyonce and that was really challenging. Um, I'll just say that like, you know, at that level, it's just really hard. And I was like, I don't love this. And like, if I don't love dancing for Beyonce, am I ever going to love dancing again? Like I just felt so over it. And so then my friend was friends with uh, a big hosting agent and she got me a meeting. And so I went in and I was like, I've hosted this show for in you know, this music series. And now I'd like to be a host. And she was like, well, you need to what go on the bachelor. Wait, <laughs> Yes. Wait, One what? of the biggest hosting agents in, and this was 2012, 2012, I think 2013. Um, yeah. If you want to have a television career, you have to go on the bachelor. And I was like, okay, great. So I signed up for the bachelor. I was on the bachelor. I don't know if you know this, uh, but well, I was on, I saw like a, a, a small yes. clip. I wanted to ask you about it. But There's how <laughs> this so is one on the bachelor. So I went, so oh listen, I, at the time I went on and applied, I was single okay. and my best friend, Christina Perry and I were like very sad, having sad salads. And we were like, and I was like, well, they told me if I want to be a host, I got to go on the batch. She's like, great, let's sign you up. And so they signed me up. And then by the time I got cast on it, I had actually sort of started dating my husband. I talk about this in the Lady Gang book, but like I had met him and we had been dating and then I got the call and I was like, well, nothing stands in the way of my career. I was like, yeah. he was like, will you be my girlfriend? I was like, I don't want a boyfriend because I'm going to go on The Bachelor. And he was like, <laughs> okay. He literally took me to downtown LA to get my dress for like, cause they make you bring like your opening night and then they make you bring a formal dress in case you like get engaged. And I was like, can you help me pick out an engagement dress? Like what the f was I how this man doesn't hate my guts is unbelievable. Anyway, so I go on The Bachelor. I was on Brad Womack's second season. He had a high kick out of the limo. I hated it the moment it began. I hated, I don't know how you did this multiple times. I hated it so much. Everything about it made my skin crawl. Like I, I did meet some really cool people, mm -hmm. um, which was like the highlight for sure. But like, I mean, I remember walking up to Brad Womack and he had so much face makeup on and I was like, 
oh God, you're like so odd looking. And then yeah. like, I remember, go I just felt so uncomfortable. So um, anyway, good because the bachelor didn't like me. I got kicked off on night two. I made it past the first rose ceremony. You know, the one where he comes in and like you, um, you, you can't remember everyone's name. Mm -hmm. So like they come in and they, they'll be like, Kelty, Hannah, Stacy, and they'll give you the roses. And then he walks out for like 10 minutes to yeah. learn more names yeah. <laughs> and then comes back in to like do more names. Cause you can't learn anyone. So I thought like, Oh my God, he loves me. But like, he had no idea who it was. Um, and so the next day I got the next part, I got kicked off. So I was only really there for like, I think with the quarantine before, like maybe five days. Um, so it did not help my, uh, hosting career at all being on the bachelor. Thank you very much. Top agent. Um, but after that I signed up for like a hosting class in LA and I, um, I, I was making videos and, and got, uh, was like a host for this company called Buzznet. And I was at a lunch and some lady was like, oh, well, like I'm trying to like build up the, the digital team at, um, I'm trying to build up the digital team at CBS. Would you ever, um, consider doing what you do for BuzzNet for CBS? And I was like, sure. I'd never like even been on a, like, I'd never had a real job in my life. I'd always been a dancer. So I went over and I was so excited. And so for two years, I just had this little show on the insider.com, which was part of CBS where I like made videos and, and was like interviewing celebrities. I did Ed Sheeran's first LA interview. Oh I did the God. first interview with Imagine Dragons, like all these unknown artists that were just playing these tiny rooms in LA. So I know I'm like, I never get chose to be at the table. So we did a book last fall and I got a call from um, a gentleman named John Redman, who's an executive producer of E-News. And they were like, hey, like, I want to talk to you. Like, can we set up a call? And I didn't know where he was working because he used to be at a different show. And I don't know what he was doing. I was like, John, I'm super busy. I'm on tour. I can talk to you. No, uh, like, let's do something in November when I'm back for tour or October when I'm back from tour. I totally blew this man off thinking he just wanted to like get a lunch um, and ask me about podcast. I don't know what he wanted. So then like I do all I go do the tour and then I get back and I'm like, he's like, can we set up the Zoom? And I was like, oh, a Zoom. OK. And then on the Zoom is like all these executives from NBC. And I was like, oh my God. And so then <laughs> I get on the Zoom and they're like, we want you to come to E! News. It was the only time I've ever been offered a job, point blank, not like auditioned or struggled or whatever. So it, I did get offered that job. And I, I think I was so touched. My ego was like, oh my God, you love me that I just said yes on the Zoom. So I was like, like, yeah, let's do it. Finally, somebody <laughs> sees that I'm awesome. <laughs> And I was they like, would. oh, my God, OK, um, I didn't really want to go back to entertainment news. It's so it's it can be so difficult and it's so mm -hmm. time consuming. But I have loved it. So um, but yeah, so you that was really funny. Really, your outfits are really good. I mean, it's tell you. When you work on different shows, different shows have different things with, that they're trying to do. So whereas yeah. like one show might invest all of their money and budget in breaking news, having the most coverage possible. And then for them, like maybe wardrobe is like not an afterthought, but like it's not the important part. Mm -hmm. For E, there's literally eight people and two stylists dressing us. Oh, I've seen like, it. Being eight, it's, right. Eight it's people. Crazy. Like the clothes are, I've never, I remember getting there and then I was like, they were putting clothes on me and I was like, oh, I'll wear this. And then maybe we could shorten it. I'll wear it again or whatever. And they're like, we don't wear things again. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I've never worn the same thing. What? So that was like really amazing. And I also think like, um, we, we were talking about therapy. Like, I think that the, re everyone's like, oh my God, you look so good. You look so good. I think the reason that people are feeling that way when they see me is that I did have time off. Mm -hmm. So I like, I slept for the first time after 10 years of not sleeping and being up at, you know, four in the morning and going till 10 o'clock at night at premiere. So I slept, I did a lot of therapy. Yeah. I'm, I'm right in my soul. And so I think that that does shine through. I, I don't have, I mean, I have some desperation, but less than I used to. I have mm -hmm. some, you know, uh, I just, I dealt with a lot and, and, and I really got good in my heart and my soul. And I feel like that is shining out to the viewers. I think that definitely shows. And with anyone, I think once you've like actually looked into why do I feel so desperate? Why do I feel so unseen? It's probably has really not much to do with what's going on. Like in the present, it's all like past things. Yeah. And so once you've like healed that, it's like, 
finally show up and be present. And that's not the thing that's drive is not in the driver's seat. Maybe it's like in the, the middle yes. seat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's in the middle seat. It's in the middle, it's seat. In the middle seat, but it's not like taking over anymore. And I do think that people can see that when you said like, you just like had never done it before, but you just like went straight into it. I remember when I was on, the, I was the bachelorette. Yeah. I, they're like, Hey, we want you to host this, um, fall preview of the shows that are going to be on there. Yeah. I was like, sure. I had no idea. I'd never met a teleprompter in my life. And I, but I think I just had no idea. And I was so open to like whatever came to me that I crushed it. Yeah. You crushed. I, I had no idea what I was doing, but I'm like, Oh, you just read this teleprompter. Um, okay. I can do this now that I have had like uh, some success or I now know more about it. I'm in the stage, have not been doing this for long, um, that I get even like, I psych myself out more. Did you have a time like that? Now you've been doing it for so long. I don't know if you mm -hmm. still struggle with that, but was there a mm -hmm. moment like maybe it was like after insider, like digital, mm -hmm. like 100%. Time that you're like, oh shoot. Now I have to be really good. That was just, yeah. it was fun. Yeah. Now it has to be awesome. Yeah. So I was on uh, the show called The Insider, which got canceled on CBS. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was a sister show to Entertainment Tonight. And when it got canceled, um, oh, I was the, I can't remember exactly. So please don't like quote me on this. Kevin had already moved over to each. I think I was the only person, the only talent that they moved from Insider to ET. And ET was always like the big dream, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I remember they had me do a stage test or something. Like I had gotten the job and then they just wanted, I was filming like some promos or something. And so they put me in the dress and then I was standing on the ET stage for the first time. Keep in mind, both of those stages were in the same room. It was like insider was here. ET was mm -hmm. like across, like it was the same crew. It's the same cameraman. It's the same guy putting the mic down your shirt. Like that have been doing this for six years for me on Insider. So like there was no reason to feel uncomfortable. Like it was literally family. I got up there. It was like, I could not read a teleprompter. Like I had never delivered the news in my life. And I had been doing it for so long to the point where the executive producer name was Sharon at the time came on stage, grabbed my shoulders. And she goes, what is going on with you? Are you okay? I was like, I'm just so excited to be on the stage. This <laughs> happens to everyone. It's it's so hard when you care. Yes, when you care and it's something that you really want. And do you feel like now you've done all these things, you still have those moments? Like, did you have that um, with, e well, I guess E! News came to you because like you yeah. made it, girl. But yeah. with like Superfan, like pitching that, did you feel that at all? I I, there's times on super fan that I'm like, why does my voice sound like that? Cause mm -hmm. I was so excited, nervous, like thrilled, you know, I think that it is. And I, I have to be honest, I work with like the biggest, best television hosts in the world. Everyone messes up, yeah. everyone screws up. And I think you learn to like, we call it the save, like you learn to save. So if you mm -hmm. say something or you go off, like you don't stop, you don't just go, Oh, no, no, let me do it again. Cause you you may be a lot of times you're doing live TV or whatever. You mm -hmm. just learn to save it. So, and I think that the world is, is very into like, the, I think of Gail King on CBS mornings and it's like, she'll start a question and then she'll be like, let me rephrase. And then she'll like go and say, you know, and it's like the imperfection again is so mm -hmm. relatable. We don't want to be perfect robots. Um, and so even in auditions, I mean, I've never really auditioned, but like in auditions or things like that, I'll just be like, I'll just be like, and then this is part of the part that I would be really charming and wonderful. And then I like go back to the prompter and I read it again. Like I just, I sort of like take the piss out of my own self because, and I think it like makes everyone relax. I think I'm going to go with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go with that for myself because um, I think when I watch other people and they like, yeah, you can tell like they're nervous or something. I'm like, oh, I get you. I yeah. feel that. Like, it's okay. And you yeah. should be nervous. I was so nervous for Superfan. And I was like, why am I so nervous? Well, yes, because a network gave me millions and millions and millions of dollars to make this show. It better be great. And you better be the best you've ever been. Like, of course I felt nervous. How did you even uh, like come up with the idea or feel the confidence or even know what you were doing to create a show? 
Well, I think I've always been creating, like creating my life and then created Lady Gang and then created, but um, my husband's a music manager. And so a lot of the inspiration for this came from him because he works with these A-list clients and there's really nowhere for these big, big stars to go to promote music anymore. Like when I was growing up in the nineties, it was like TRL, MTV Unplugged, like there was tons of music programming and it just doesn't exist anymore. And so I really wanted to make a show where you could like get to know these huge musical acts. And then I really wanted to show for the untalented person. I, you know, I've covered and watched every talent show on television. America's Got Talent, you gotta light yourself on fire, you gotta do magic, gotta have a dog that does tricks. Uh, American Idol, you gotta be able to sing, so you think you can dance, you gotta be able to dance. What about the people with no talent? What if my talent is just bedazzling a bodysuit to wear to the heiress tour? What if my talent is just loving the, all the Backstreet Boys and loving AJ the most. Like, what if that is my talent? And so I really thought there should be a place for just the normies of the world to go and celebrate. And that's what Superfan is. It's a competition for like the everyday fan that their life's work, their purpose, the thing that their community is this artist. And they just want to like show that love. I love it. It almost feels like it's like jeopardy but not for the person that just like knows like random facts like no I know this person yes <laughs> everything about them I feel like I'm at the point I probably could do this for Taylor Swift um yes so I, I feel that I'm like yes I'm really proud that I've learned all these things about her yes and I want her to know me so let me go on the show I think exactly. it's genius we had Kelsey Ballerini on and she was like, I can't believe you guys didn't let me compete on the Shania episode. I was like, me too. I want to host and then compete on the Shania episode. Like I'm all about it. Speaking of podcasting, were you like one of the very first podcasters out there for women? I would say, I don't yes. know when podcasting really started. So tell me all about it. Podcasting has been around. Um, it's been around. I remember when um, we started Lady Gang. It was be it was out of necessity. I um, I really wanted to host like a I wanted to be on the View or the Talk or like that kind of mm -hmm. like panel Fashion Police and I just would again, was not getting those jobs. And so yeah. I had said to my friend, I had said to Becca, who's my co-host, like oh we should do a TV show. And then she was like, well no one's gonna hire us for a TV show. And I was like, I was really into Serial, the podcast at the time. And I was like, well, what if we do a podcast version of the TV show and use it only as our, because it wasn't cool to be a podcaster, um, use it as a proof of concept for a television series. We'll make the biggest podcast in the world and then they'll give us a TV show. And she was like, great. So we, we put it all together and that is actually what happened um, with E. They called us after the first couple episodes and they were like, do you want to do a digital series based on the show? And we're like, no, we want to do a TV show. We're going to become the biggest podcast in the world. We're going to come back to you and do a TV show. Show. And so we waited a couple years and then we did Lady Gang on E. It got canceled pretty quickly. So maybe we were like a little bit too <laughs> excited about that. Um, but did we it. did it. And and yeah, we were one of the first female podcasts. I think there was there was some, you know, there was definitely others. But um, a lot of I, I've been really proud to be a trailblazer you know, podcasts were not really touring and we had this idea like to do live podcasts. I um, So we, we started doing live podcasts and we started doing merch lines and we did our book. And so um, we really, you know, we've been at the forefront of that and made it possible that you can, you know, podcasting can be a full-time job and it can be a full-time uh, business and world in which people live in and are very successful. And, um, and it can be people like you that are, already have notoriety and fame, mm -hmm. but also I love to see, you know, we have a podcast podcast friends called the I've had it girls and they're just like two ladies. They're, they're so amazing. funny. And it's they're like, funny. you know, they, they didn't have any notoriety before this, but have had, found great success. So I'm, I'm thrilled all the way around for everybody. Well, I, I thank you for doing what you've done because yeah, you made it more fun. Like live shows, merch, those are the, those are the fun parts of it. So I didn't know that that was like something that wasn't around that y'all like just did this really cool. No, the um, only reason we did merch because Jack Vanek is my partner and she had a clothing line and she was like, we should do hoodies. And I was like, hoodies. And we did them and then they sold out and we're like, we should do sweatsuits and then we should do t-shirts. And then that all led, you know, so and it's now it, everybody has a hoodie and I everyone has it. a hoodie and I love it. And I buy them all. It's really cool. Like finding out like you like kind of like have felt like the underdog, but you've, you've always made the things that you want happen. 
do you, are you like a big manifester? Yes. Okay. Is that, is that the key to all of this? Huge. Yeah. So I literally on the other side of this computer is a, 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 a piece of paper and it has all my 2023 goals. And I look at it every day. I see it every day. So the, the, the mat, I'll tell you quick manifesting story. So, um, when I had moved to LA, this is pre bachelor and Christina and I were living in shitty apartments. She was nobody. I was nobody. Um, and we got really sad and we, we came to the conclusion that we needed to ask the universe for what we wanted. We needed to start manifesting and we're like, let's write letters to the universe. So we, we wrote letters to the universe. My first letter, I think this is 2013 was like quit diet Coke, stop dating assholes. You know, like it would like put 25,000 or 25,000. I wish put $25 in a savings account every month and try to like build up a nest egg. Like I was, it was real bad. Hers was like, um, meet and fall in love with Jason Mraz, make a music video, play three shows, have a hit song, like ridiculous. Cause she was, no, she didn't have a record deal. She didn't even have record music, forward facing music. She had nothing. And she was like, yeah, I'm going to meet and marry Jason. We loved Jason. We'd still love Jason Mraz. Um, okay. So I swear to God, we go to bed in my shitty apartment. She lived down the block. She goes to her apartment. We wake up the next morning and she calls me on the phone and she's like, you need to come over. So I run over to her apartment. She got a Facebook message. From Jason Mraz's no. manager. <laughs> no. The next morning, Hannah, Jason Mraz's manager being like, hey, I work with Jason Mraz. I saw your video on YouTube of you singing. I'd love to take a meeting. That year, she met Jason Mraz. They wrote songs together. She played way more than three shows because Jar of Hearts went on So You Think You Can Dance and became a number one song. She signed a massive record deal and everything happened for her. And I met my husband. So I stopped dating assholes. So I, we both won. And what ever since Coke? I, it took me many more years to quit Diet okay. Coke, <laughs> um, about 10. Yet. And uh, I'm just a little, uh, we're in like in a small drips. Um, but every <laughs> December 31st, Christine and I connect on New Year's Eve. We write each other letter. We write our letters. We share letters with each other, we write them out. We have them done. And so, um, yeah, there I I'm, you have to look at it every day. How have you, um, fully fostered the lady gang community like what do you think that secret has been because you do you have like oh my god people, a zillion like, things yeah i mean i lent one of them my wedding dress no, i no, no. oh yeah i i've paid we've paid for med we've paid medical we've done so much more than even people know like we've paid medical bills we um we're actually just doing a thing with backpacks for teachers where we're working um and sending out like care packages to like 300 of our lady gang teachers and our facebook group um I, I mean, they're like my friends. Like I talk to them and we love them and we've seen them forever. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, we've sent merch, we've sent money, we've sent gift cards. We, we just love them. Like I, I just, you know, I think, I think just being seen and seeing them, but they, they do more for us than we do for them for sure. Like they're the best. Yeah. I think that's, that was the number one reason I wanted to start a podcast is I felt like I had all these people that have yeah. been championing me um, through some of the best and worst times of mm -hmm. my life. And mm -hmm. it's still like they're here. Mm -hmm. And I feel like through that, I didn't, social media was like hard for me. I didn't know, mm -hmm. want to connect. I didn't want to be on there because I was dealing with my own stuff. Yeah. And now I feel like I'm so much more open and I want, yeah. I want to celebrate and be with these people who have like stuck around been yeah. there and like I want this to work for them and for to be able to give back in some way because they've given me I love everything that. yes and so that's probably one of the things that I w look up the most to about Lady Gang like I think it's so cool that y'all been able to branch off and you know, did a tv show but and have all these like just can do live shows but really the community yeah. that you created is pretty awesome um, and I think that has a lot to do with how you cultivate that. Yeah. It's yeah. not always easy. I mean, some people hate us now, like oh, yeah. we've had people love us and then hate us, but you know, I think it's, it's, um, people just, it's hard to make friends as an adult. So it's, I think it's a really cool thing to be able to like, um, you know, find people that are interested in the same thing as you, whether it be like yeah. the lady gang TV watchers or our lady gang book club or any of those things. Like it's, it's so special. So, and lady gang moms. Yeah. By the way, I, when I was um, doing all my research, 
I knew that you had a book out, but I bought it immediately. I'm so <laughs> excited. I got at like a lady. I'm like, this is a really I would have sent that to you. Book. No. I mean, no, you need it's you always like good. It. We won't oh, thanks. Like, I'm gonna review it. We'll leave with five stars. Okay. Thank um, you. But I I think it's a really good book. Like, thank you. It was really good. And I, I didn't get Lady Secrets, but I got Act Like a Lady. Yeah. And that's our hit one. They, they, that's they, a hit. Act Like a Lady is a hit. Lady okay. Secrets is like a follow up. I, I get it. Um, yeah. But I think it's cool how you like share okay. and continue. I think that's the, the key in all this is not pretending like even though you have made it in a way mm -hmm. in a lot of people's eyes. To, to continue to tell the stories of like how you got there. Mm -hmm. And it is a lot of falling down, dusting yourself off and getting back up and being like, I deserve this. Mm -hmm. And that I really connect with. And um, you inspire me. And I'm so Aww, thankful honey. that you came on. And um, you really are one of the most like interesting, but also um, impressive. You're so Aww. impressive. Oh and, my God, thanks. and even those days when you're like, oh my gosh, but... I kind of felt like I looked like a hoe when I was like, yeah, no, you're so impressive. And you can I'm the most to. impressive hoe in the area. And I will, you know what? I'm putting that on my tombstone. Most impressive hoe. Hannah most Brown. impressive hoe. Hannah Brown. That's what I'll, that's what I'll write about you. Anywhere. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited for super fan. Thank you. Uh, We're airing Wednesday nights on yes. CBS at 9 PM after you watch big brother. So, um, I'm not sure when this is coming out, but like, I think Shania is next. Then we have Gloria Stefan. Uh -huh. Then we have, um, Pitbull. We have little big, I know your country girl. We have a little big town. We have Kelsey Ballerini. So, um, tune in. No, it's really impressive. All the people that you have on, I think it caters to every type of music. Uh, I'm really excited for the success of all this show that I know that Thank you're going to you. have. The first episode was amazing. So can't wait for Shania. Oh, that, God. That, I'll be living for that. The best. Thank, thank you, Kelty, so much. I appreciate you and continue to root you on and all the things that I know you'll continue to do great. Thank you.